Okay, so now we come to another facet of this whole topic of why evil, Satan argues, and God replies, God deeds versus good deeds, God deeds for relationship. And all those things are all intertwined. When you finally come to grips with that information and you can verify it um, first of all in the Bible that's where you learn it you know that's where I, I learned it um, and then you know you can test it with logic and you know how does everything fit together and you can see that all the evidence all the data fits I mean you have to play with it I mean it took me 10 years to figure this out so it's not an overnight thing but when you come to the point where you see how it fits, you realize that the same information that everybody's been living on has completely missed this point about why we're here and what God did, even though we use the same words. And it's devastating. That's the last increment I think I want to put in on this topic. Because I've really already covered it in the web pages exhaustively. It's devastating to know this. It undercuts your entire existence. Everything you thought you were living for. To realize that, hi, there's nothing I do that has any significance of its own. Good or bad, really. You live and you die and that's it. Now, after you die, the question is where you live after that. And, of course, for most people, they don't even think about that question, except superficially, during their lives. They don't think about the idea that Romans 8 tells you, um, that life is but a pregnancy. That's specifically in Romans 8, 11. But that's Paul's favorite theme. He covers it in Galatians and Corinthians and other places. Life is down here is but a pregnancy. Real life doesn't begin until you die. And if you don't wake up to that fact, what's going to happen instead, and when we hear it every day, is that people get to a point in life where they are disillusioned. You start out as a child thinking, oh, you know, you look at your parents, you look at all the pretty colors, you look at this and that and the other thing and you think to yourself, I want to be this, I want to be that, I, uh, I, 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 and you have this hallucination that you can actually achieve something in life. But by the time you're 40 or 50, you realize that that was all a lot of bunk. And the more you achieved in this life, the more onerous it is to you. The more success you have in life, the more jaded you actually become because you've gone after those things you got some success and it didn't turn out the way you expected even when you got everything you wanted what you realized what you wanted you didn't understand and what you wanted wasn't as good as you expected it to be and of course if you never achieve the things that you went after in life, you're always going to be blaming somebody else for all of your so-called missed opportunities. But what you never realize is that had you gotten what you wanted, it wouldn't have been what you wanted. So at one way or another, by the time we start reaching our you know, 40s and 50s, and especially much later, we get to be pretty jaded and bitter. And we never find out, most of us, what this life was really down here was supposed to be about. Okay, well that jadedness, that bitterness is due to a realization that gradually or suddenly hits you. That everything down here is for nothing. It really is. Well, it's okay, so you achieved greatness and this and that and the other thing you're living on the hallucination that other people actually care about that the truth is they care about it for like five minutes and they give you kudos for like five minutes and then they go do the dry cleaning or get Johnny a haircut or cook dinner 
or they use your greatness to try and um, assign greatness to themselves because if they know your greatness and admit it that makes them somehow better so it's still not about you and 99% of them don't even understand what you achieved 99% of people who read Shakespeare do not understand it they praise it they don't have any clue what he was writing and it really wasn't Shakespeare from what I'm beginning to believe friend of mine was trying to tell me it was Edward de Vere and I now see some justification for that argument but whoever the guy really was he wrote sterling stuff that you have to study over and over and over and over to get it the same thing is true of the Bible nobody understands the Bible all the discussion on YouTube is puerile is God one or three? Do you have to do something besides believe in Christ to be saved? Do you wear hats on Sunday? Do you have to repent of your sins to be saved? Are you saved if you don't do good deeds after salvation? Those are baby arguments. Nobody's actually learning the Bible. Granted, you have to go through that phase. It should last about five years, but if, you're over, if you've been a Christian for more than five years and you're still debating those issues, something's wrong with you. You're not using 1 John 1 9 clearly. So what's going to happen to you as a Christian is going to be the same thing that happens to the rest of the human race. By the time you're 50 or 60 or usually even before, you're going to wake up one day and find out, you know what, and, and this is why a lot of people leave Christianity. This isn't what it's cracked up to be. I'm not getting a return for the effort I'm expending. What the heck is this life for? You get disappointed. You get disillusioned. You get bitter. Now, that's a necessary growth process. Because this life is not about all these fantasies we have about it to start with. It's not about having a good house. It's not about having a good car. It's not about having the right spouse. It's not about having, you know, a good job. It's not about being respected. All that stuff pales. And people really don't respect you. They really don't give you any thought. They're too busy with their own business of their own life. They smile at you and they say nice things. And you see, if you are stupid enough to think that their compliments mean anything, then you, you're still wet behind the ears and you never grew out of childhood, even, you know, human childhood. So sooner or later, you're going to get jaded. Sooner or later, you're going to wake up and say, hey, wait a minute. This is a loss. What's all this for? That's a divine design, as well as the natural effect of this meaningless life we all got down here. God wants you to realize that life on its own apart from Him is meaningless. God wants you to realize that all these ideas that with fantasies we have about life are, don't hold any water. Whether you achieve something in life or not. You fool yourself if you achieve something and you fool yourself if you fail because if you fail you're going to blame it on somebody else or yourself. And never wake up to the fact that the thought that what you thought you wanted to achieve wasn't worth it to start with. Now there's a third way, and you're going to even do it more as a Christian, because you're going to be hustling for God, because you don't read the Bible properly and you think it's about good deeds. You're going to be hustling for God and you're not getting paid for that hustling. It doesn't pay off. And then you're going to blame God. And most people who become atheists, that's why. They expect, a, a, you know, God to be sugar daddy or petty judge. And he doesn't live up to their expectations. So they, jet, they, they junk the whole God thing. Whether they're Muslim or Christian or whatever. The God that they expect God to be isn't the way they expect Him to be. And sooner or later they wake up to that, so they conclude that God doesn't exist. And they're very bitter. You can't talk to an atheist reasonably, for the most part. They're, you know, like everybody else. Like, there's 1% of Christians who are reasonable, the rest are wacko. Same thing is true for atheists, Muslims, you know, whatever religion you want to name. They're, they're pissed off. 
Because God didn't turn out the way they expected. You too will be if you don't learn and live on Bible. But, now here's the flip side and the point of this audio. If you do learn and live on Bible, you're going to eventually start to put the pieces together. And then you too will be just as devastated because you find out, you know what, my whole life is a pile of doo-doo. That's the point of learning scripture. That's not the final point, but it's a necessary juncture in maturity. You have to get to the place where you realize that this whole life down here is a pile of junk. And the more you learn Bible, the more you come to that conclusion. And then you really, it, you know, you come to the conclusion early. I mean, they, you're taught this early. This is not the only life. It doesn't mean anything. You have this great and glorious life afterwards, and you mouth it and mouth it. But it doesn't really mean anything to you. But one day it hits home. And at that point, you're going to stop believing in God. Or you're going to look for sublimation somewhere else to assuage the pain. Or you're going to start looking at Bible more seriously. In my case, it was the latter. Every Christian's going to go through this. Every Christian gets to the point, just like everybody who's not a Christian, where he realizes that, that this life isn't what it's cracked up to be. And our ideas of God, and how we live with God, and how we work for God, they don't pay off either. So are we going to get mad at God, or we had to take a second look at the Bible and try to figure out what the heck's going on here. And when you do that, the first thing that starts to hit you is, Oh, crud, Romans 8. This life doesn't mean anything. You know, it's like Shakespeare said, Tale told by an idiot signifying nothing. I believe that's at the end of Macbeth. Okay? And, and that hits you between the eyes. I mean, when I, when I first realized, you know, like everybody else, I was the dumbass Christian and I was just mouthing everything off, blah, de, blah, de, blah. Wouldn't matter if I had it right if I didn't understand it. And then, you know, I kept on studying because I was interested in God. Just because I was, that's not a good deed on my part. So you want to know God or you don't. Okay, he's the one with the merit. And I kept on wanting to know, and he grew me out of my idiocies one by one. And then about, I want to say about 15 years ago, it all came together in my head. I realized, this, what, what, what is this life down here? It's pointless. There's no point in getting married, so I never did. There's no point in having success, so I didn't try for any. There's no point in doing anything. Because you live and then you die and that's it. So the only reason to live is God. Now in my case I sort of got jaded early. When I was seven. And that's a long story that I don't see how it will be helpful to you. You know, that kind of parallel in your life. You, you've got your own and you can figure it out for yourself. But at some point... You wake up and you say, you know what? It's either something's very wrong with my belief in God or the Bible, or I really just don't know this material enough. What's the answer here? Because otherwise you just want to kill yourself. Or you do what most people do and you, you know, go into drugs or you go into drink or you try to sublimate some other way to get some pleasure out of things. Or you go into super achievement or you go into even more good deeds. My pastor likes to call that um, the boomerang and emotional revolt. That's the negative, you know, the negative reaction to realizing life is, is meaningless. But even on a positive end... It's devastating to realize that there is absolutely no value to your life and that that's part of the divine design. God could have made you differently. This is Satan's big thing. So I'm harping on it. Satan is the greatest creature God ever made. 
prior to the, you know, the conclusion of the conflict, you know, before man was made. Because some of the angels advanced ahead of him as a result of that. They had their own civil war. And some of the angels advanced spiritually beyond him as a result. Those are the seraphim. Satan was just cherubim. That was lower. Okay, but the point is, is that he was the highest creature to ever come from the hand of God initially. And even he looks at it and says, Why am I here? What the hell's the point? What's the point? Okay? I am insufferably lower than God. The more you know God, the more you realize how inferior you are compared to Him. It's really hard to live with that. That's Satan's number one argument. Because that's what made him trip up. And if he's the highest creature and this is what made him trip up, this is what happens to all of us. If God exists and I'm so low and weak and my life is so horrible, how is that fair? Okay? But now flip that same argument over. Your life is pointless no matter what it is. There are a whole lot of people, apparently 84,500 people, in this world who are worth more than $50 million. And I'd bet you that much money, if I had it, that only about 1% of them are happy. The money didn't make them happy. And then, of course, you know, you got the poor, which are many thousands more. They're not happy. It's not about having money. It's about whatever you are. This life is just not good enough to live. It's not worth it. Even if everything went right. Even if you were like Endora or Samantha on Bewitched and could zap anything that you wanted. You become bored. That's the biggest problem with being rich. Is that you've got the money, you can buy anything you want, and, and the challenge and the enjoyment of it ends up being too small. Okay? The enjoyment of things be, it ends up being too small. The enjoyment of relationships ends up being too small. You want more. And it's not here. Am I making you depressed enough? That's what I'm aiming at here. At some point you come to the realization that this is all a waste of time. And that's when you become depressed or tempted sorely to be depressed. And then, to add insult to injury, if you're learning this through scripture, you realize that... Uh, I'm down here and this everything I do is worthless all that I achieve is going to die and turn to dust all these you know approval that I get from people they're not really approving me that's just I'm entertainment to them I'm a way of them buttressing their ego my achievements they're trying to you know glom onto so they compliment me and that makes them feel better about themselves they didn't really understand what I achieved they didn't understand what I said so it's devastating to realize the pointlessness and that's what scripture causes you to know you get there early by learning scripture or you get there late by learning it from the hard knocks of life. What do you do at that point? Well, you can just go crawl in a hole. This is what, you know, psychologists call life change. You know, they come up with all these kind of facocked explanations about it. Okay. Your life change. You're going through a phase. And it usually happens at 40 or 50, so they mistake it as being something that's associated with age. It's not. It's just that people are too stupid. And it takes them that long to figure out that they've wasted their time. 
until they've spent their life raising kids and the kids are finally off to college so now you have a chance to think for yourself and then you realize what did I do I'm alive I'm a person what do I spend my life for what do I spend my life on and at this point you realize that life isn't worth it so you try to hallucinate and get messianic you start getting into causes you start getting into hobbies, and this will make me happy, and that will make me happy. Some people, they sublimate by buying a lot of things, or going on trips. And they tell themselves, well, I, you know, I've got the kids in college now, I can, I can finally live my life. Okay, but it never turns out the way you want. So, you know, after you do that for a few years, or a few weeks, or a few months, then you realize that's no good. And then that's when a lot of people turn to religion. Okay, or philosophy. Or literature. Or it's when they get goofy about art. You know, like that guy who paints all those blue dogs that people pay thousands and thousands of dollars for. It's the same blue dog. He paints the same blue dog. And people pay thousands of dollars for that. All that goofiness is an indication of people who are jaded about life. They're looking for any port in the storm to give them meaning to life because they realize secretly, or at least subliminally, that there is no meaning. What do you do? That's when the opportunity is the keenest. Usually at age 20 when you start to ask the same question. And age 50 because between 20 and 50 you're too busy. When you're starting to ask the question, what's the meaning of life? Because you realize something's drastically wrong. That's when you got the opportunity to learn this thing about God deeds versus good deeds and what God designed this for in the first place. But it's hard to come to grips with that. Especially if it's new to you. I mean, I've been wrestling with this question now for 15 years. And every single day, it's a shock. Every single day I've been more and more distressed about how puny life is and I don't want to even get up in the morning because there's nothing down here worth doing except I can learn something more about God today. Holy Spirit's going to work on me to make me more attractive to God today. That's what gets me up in the morning. Now, a lot of people don't get that motive. They never get that far. They are too distressed about finding out the pointlessness of life. To even ask the question, isn't there an alternative? Or if they ask the question, what's the alternative? They're so crazed by their upset over the meaninglessness that they pick any port in a storm. So they go after some guru or they go after some painting class or you know a new boyfriend new girlfriend they divorce their spouse they sell everything they have and they get on a yacht and live on a boat and and they still spend their time sublimating in order to get away from the question that they can't answer they don't ask the question well maybe my whole thought pattern about God was wrong to start with. Especially Christians don't ask this question. They just keep treading on the treadmill. The typical reaction of a religious Christian is he gets deeper into his religion, therefore he's getting farther and farther away from the answer. Even while he's mouthing God all the time. The answer is that God wants to pour himself into you through the very smallest things you do. Because he's pouring himself into everything, whether it's animate or not. That's how he loves to live. He made this sovereign choice that he would pour himself into everything he creates. That's how he likes to live. So it doesn't matter that we're at the low end. But it's very uncomfortable for us to be at the low end. Which is Satan's contention that God did it wrong. So every time... And it's very, it happens very rarely. 
every time somebody says, okay, God, do it to me. I don't care how I feel. I want the relationship. Every time you vote to know God more, whether you feel good or bad and you feel both, full spectrum, everything with God is full spectrum. You're proving Satan wrong, even though that's not what you mean to do. And of course, the more you grow in the spiritual life, the, the less animosity you have towards Satan. You understand how he got where he got. Because you go through the same process. The whole point of the cross is that, that the, the very complaint that Satan had, Christ lived the life that Satan could never live. Christ went farther because he was made human rather than an angel. He went farther down than Satan went. It was harder on Christ than it was on Satan. He lived the whole paradigmal life that Satan was you know, complaining about. Except that he lived it as a human, which is worse. Satan doesn't have to pee. Satan doesn't have to wait all day to eat them a meal. I mean, because remember, Christ was living during very low technology. In those days, you had to, you know, if it wasn't for the fact that you had lots and lots of people around you, everybody doing part of the job, you would have to spend all day just hunting, skinning, cooking your one meal. It would take you all day. Just to eat. Let alone build anything to sleep in. That's as hard as it gets. So Christ is the answer to Satan's contention in the trial about how unfair God was to make us small. God's answer is, Hi, I don't care how small you are. I'll pour myself into you and I'll make a God-quality deed out of your smallness. All you have to do is say yes. Now, the thing that you are and the thing that you do every single minute never changes. The sins were hitting Christ on the cross. The sins didn't change. They just, he was just stabbed with them. God the Father stabbed God the Son in his humanity with human sins. Stabbed him, that's it. For three hours, all the sins that have ever been sinned, so that tells you the intensity, were stabbed into Christ on the cross. That's Isaiah 53, 6. Okay? The sins didn't change. The stabbing was something I can't even imagine. I can't imagine the intensity, and I surely don't know how, how come it didn't kill him. I mean, obviously the Holy Spirit sustained him. Because Christ didn't use his own power. That was the deal. Otherwise, Satan could, could cry foul. So the Holy Spirit sustained him. Christ just kept on saying yes to it being done to him. That's it. There's no magic there. There's no changing of the nature of sin there. Sin retains its own character. You retain your own character. What you do retains its own character. It's completely and utterly meaningless. No matter how moral, no matter how immoral, no matter how high or how low, because everything you are, everything you think, is just a speck of dust. It's a totally hopeless situation. Totally depressing situation. Totally useless. This is why people become criminals. At, at some point they realize that this life is just a joke, it's just a game, might as well steal and rob and have all the pleasure. That's sort of peripherally covered in second half of Peter, it's 2 Peter and um, uh, 2 Thessalonians. That's sort of a running theme in 2 Thessalonians. Let's eat and drink because tomorrow we die. What the hell? Now the alternative is to have all that angst hitting you, all that recognition, hi, my life is meaningless, this is true. But at the same time, God's baptizing it. And all i got to do is say yes. See the parallel between the sins striking Christ on the cross, and that's all it was. 
and your puny life hitting you in the face all the time. See? That's all it is. Every day I wake up and I've got all these stupid things i got to do. Totally meaningless. They don't do a thing for God. Why my life? Why do I have to eat? Why do I have to pee? Why do I exist? I can't even stand my own existence. I don't care how nice it is. On the other hand, God can baptize some meaning on it he likes. Okay, please do that because I don't want to even be here. I wish I was never born. If you can make meaning out of my life that pleases you, then I, I don't mind. It's okay if I breathe. So you got that duality going on, just like the cross. The sins are hitting Christ on the cross. Now look, it's not doing God the Father any good for those sins to, to strike Christ on the cross. That's not doing anything for Father. The sins are still the sins. They're not doing anything, and they're certainly not doing anything for Christ. He's being hurt by those sins. He should have been killed. So it seems like a very sadistic thing to do. Because striking Christ with our sins does not do a thing for Father. Did not do a thing for Christ. It didn't change the sins. And him striking Christ with the sins actually did not pay for them either. The Bible tells us what paid for sins. What paid for sins was what Christ was thinking. That's Isaiah 53.11. The dato yad stik. By his knowledge he makes righteous. Not by the sins hitting him. So okay, so why did God have the sins hit him in the first place? And why a cross? Why be that sadistic? All of these are Satan's arguments and they're valid. But are you beginning to understand why God did it that way? The thing is what it is. Truth be free. And if A happens, that creates a juridical occasion for God to baptize the event with the meaning he wants. That's totally separate from the thing that happens. The sins hitting Christ on the cross are totally unfair. Okay, well then that's a juridical issue. Why should Christ be hit with our sins? Why should Father go to the trouble to do that? It certainly didn't please him to do that, and it doesn't do him any good to do that. So that's a juridical question. If that's going to happen, what should be the divine juridical justification for it? And what's the reward? Christ on his part is saying, Dad, I want a cost. I love you so much, I need a cost. What kind of cost can I have? I want the highest cost possible. That's Christ's own motive. And you see that in Hebrews 12 too. I mean, everything I'm telling you, I'm getting from Bible verses. And you should be able to find them on your own. So, God is gifting Christ by lacerating him with our sins. He's gifting him. Okay, but that's a kind of crappy gift. Okay, he wants a he wants a, a cost. Okay, so God the Father is a statist, and Christ is a masochist. And to suit his son, who's a masochist, he lacerates him with our sins. Okay, but where's the justice? The justice is the contract in Isaiah fifty three ten. If your soul will be a substitute for sin, im tasim asham nafsho, in my badly pronounced Hebrew. If you will make your soul a substitute for sin, and I'm I'm sort of mixing the LXX Greek meaning with the uh, Hebrew, they both really had the same meaning, but the LXX stresses the word substitute by the word huper. Okay, or peri. I think it's who para. All right. They're making an exchange. They agreed to make an exchange. And it's already passed. Son wanted it, and father agreed to it. You can still say that's masochist and sadist, but it is a contract. Fair or not. So that part of the juridical is answered. 
It's free consent. Truth be free, free consent. That's why you have to consent to be saved. That's why you have to believe in Christ to be saved. Because it's a matter of your consent. God expressed His will, now what is yours? Because He won't violate free will. So now, God's free will is the same as it is on the cross. Call fair or not, do you want me to baptize your life with my meaning on it? Or not? Your choice. So when you realize how depressing it is that your life is meaningless on its own, if you find the idea of God attractive, and if you too, like Christ, want a cost, want a way to express, to give to Him, especially since you know you got nothing to give. Sure, God, if you can baptize something that's going to please you through my meaningless life, yeah, I want that. How's this going to work? And God says, use 1 John 1, 9 because my son paid for it. That's 1 John 1, 7. 1 John 1, 7 is the basis for 1 John 1, 9. And learn and live on Bible. Learn to think like my son. Now all of a sudden, everything in your life, like I said before, is suddenly ennobled. You're no longer just writing an email. You're no longer just going to the bathroom. You're no longer just deciding what to eat for breakfast. Everything's an occasion to learn Christ better. And to get more of his thinking in you. That's why you need the bi-directional dialogue. And it plays... As if it's obedience and, okay, what should I do now? What is Father's will for my life? It plays like that. But it's really about the relationship, the intimacy. Because any relationship is always phrased in terms of right, wrong. Because if you care about somebody, or even yourself, you care about getting it right. But, of course, you never really do. That's where the frustration comes in. Your goals are always higher than the reality. And the question is, the reality being so frustrating and meaningless, is it going to make you quit? And that's the trial issue. Christ should have quit. He had a harder job than Satan. The differential was worse for him than Satan. The meaninglessness problem was worse than Satan. Because not only is He's sitting here, here he's God, but he's attaching himself to humanity. And he pees? Hello? Is that humiliating or what? Why should he pay on top of all that for other people's sins? He stayed sinless himself despite the humiliation. And on top of that, for those of us who didn't, who didn't respond to God, who sinned instead, who rejected God, he's got to pay for all that? How fair is that? Not fair at all. And then, what happens? The sins just stab him. And that's it. They just stab him. And he keeps on saying yes. And because he says yes, God baptizes the meaning of his response as saving us by means of his knowledge he makes righteous Isaiah 53.11 you can argue all of that's arbitrary Satan does argue that okay so pretend God were arbitrary throw out all these arguments that God doesn't need any defending I mean yeah we know he's righteous he's truth and all that but pretend he weren't just call it arbitrary, because they are his decisions, right or wrong. And it's up to God to decide what right is anyway, because he's God and he's got all the power. Okay, so let's let's just wipe out the whole question of righteousness for a minute. Call it arbitrary, like Satan does. Here you have this life you got, it's meaningless, blame God for it or not. Here you have this offer from the same God says, hi, I'll make your life meaningful even when you're going to the bathroom. 
just like I did for Christ. By giving you the same thinking he had. So you can begin to see the issues as he did. And that's all I want. I just want to train you in this thinking. And you can't train yourself. And you can't learn this thinking yourself. And by the way, you're going to hurt most of the time. Do you want that or not? Most people say no. They never even get to the question. They're too busy with their hallucinations about what this life means down here. And they will not accept the fact that it's meaningless even though they know that most of the time. But a few actually go that route and they say yes. And that's the offer that you got. But before that offer really begins to make sense, the first thing you got to deal with is awakening the fact that this life down here by itself has absolutely no value to anyone at all at any time. If you think you're going to be remembered or you think that people really care about you, that's a big lie. Even if they want to care about you, they can't. You know, we all cry and moan when somebody we think we care about dies. Okay, but you still got to do the dishes. You still got to put on your pajamas. You still got to go to the dry cleaners. And sooner or later, usually sooner, the person who died, however much allegedly loved, and even, you know, people mean well, but they're liars. They forget. 9-11. Oh, yeah, well, once a year we have this Remembrance Day. We say a few nice words and we have a moment of silence for 3,700 people who died, who shouldn't have died. But who remembers them, really? And what kind of memory can you have? Most of us never knew those people. What kind of memory do we have? We have memory of an idea of people dying and we ennoble the fact that they died but if we actually knew them as individuals we wouldn't think that way of them it's only because they died and we say nice things once a year for a few minutes and then we go back to our dry cleaning and getting the hair cut and putting the tires on the car and figuring out what we're going to eat for dinner turning on the news watching a movie you see the point? We talk big about virtue and remembering and oh you live forever by means of the memory of, you know, we name buildings after people. Nobody really pays any attention. This is as much as we can do, a few minutes once a year. Standing over a grave, put a couple flowers on there. Well the person's not even in the grave anymore. The flowers are going to wilt in a couple of hours. What's the point of that? It's very depressing, huh? Versus, hi, this guy that you can't see, who seems to be pretty sadistic or masochistic, is just telling you, hi, I'm going to baptize meaning unto your life, and I'm going to teach you this other God you can't see, his thinking that this God also had humanity added to himself. It's enough to make you want to become an atheist. Or, it's enough to make you want to fall in love with God. But not without going through the jaded period. So the first stop is to wake up to the fact that your life is totally meaningless. By any count. That if you weren't here tomorrow, so what? That your existence here has absolutely no meaning whatsoever. Until you come to grips with that, this offer of God's isn't going to make a whole lot of sense. And Satan's bound and determined to mask that fact from you. He wants you to think your life has meaning in terms of people, in terms of what you're doing. That's why he stresses good deeds. Because he wants to mask God deeds. He wants to mask the issue of the fact that this life is meaningless. Because if you think life is meaningless, you're not going to want to do good deeds. You're just going to want to crawl into a hall, or get drunk, 
or commit murder or whatever makes you feel good at the moment and forget everything else. He needs you to be fooled. It's kind of like that movie Matrix. That idea just flew into my mind. He wants you to be fooled because he needs the energy of your activity to keep the, the myth alive that there's some value to what you do. See, his whole platform is based on that. He wants to attribute value to himself and what he does. In order to spawn that, he's got to make you think that there's value to what you are and what you do. And the day you wake up and realize there's no value is the day you're finally open to this real promise from God that's always been disclosed from the get-go that, hi, it's not about what you do. It's about what I can do to you so that we can have an intimate relationship. I'm not even doing it to you to, to get goodies out of you. I'm doing it to you because that's a way of expressing the relationship. And it's all one way. God's way. And it's all one direction. God's direction down to you. And you say yes. That's it. That's the whole story right there. It's not at all what we expect. It's not at all what we hawk. Because what we hawk is Satan's plan. Oh, you can do something for God. Oh, you should do something for God. Oh, it's not fair that you just believe in Christ to be saved. You should repent of your sins. Whoopee, hello? Repenting of your sins does what? Nothing. But you're sold this fantasy idea that if you repent of your sins or you put money in the collection plate <coughs> or you give up your favorite sin or you stop eating meat during Lent that somehow you're contributing something to God. What a load of crap. But you'll buy it because this recognition that life is meaningless is too horrible to contemplate. But until you do, you'll never appreciate the value and the nature of the relationship with God. Or God. <coughs> or God. Or God deeds. Well, I better stop now. God, take a cough drop.